Good evening again. And um, the theme of uh, the talk tonight is it's on, on making friends with reality. It's kind of the, the title is Absolute Cooperation with the Inevitable. This was a, um, the Jesuit philosopher and writer, teacher, Anthony de Mello, defined enlightenment or freedom or awakening as absolute cooperation with the inevitable. You think about that. I, it kind of resonates a lot with me, kind of hold it. They're all big, long words, but kind of you sit with it. It's like to cooperate with what is. You know, this moment is inevitable in the sense that it's unavoidable. It is what it is. You know, if something back there had been different, this moment could well have been different. But it wasn't. And this moment is like this. And so, you know, there's, there's an inevitability about what is. And it's, it's interesting, um, I find very interesting how... Um, how much we resist what is, the, resist the truth of what is. Um, you know, if, if I, just putting it, first of all, on a kind of on a cognitive level, on an understanding level, if you were to say to somebody, or if I were to say to somebody, would you, you know, here's a very painful and difficult thing you're experiencing now. You have a choice. Would you like to experience this or would you like to experience this plus um, mental anguish, annoyance, frustration, judgment, <laughs> all of, any or all of the above? Do you want the one or do you want the both? You know, do, do you want the ouch of something that hurts or do you want the ouch of something that hurts plus why did he do that to me? Why is the world so unfair? Why am I so stupid? You know, um, you have, we have this choice in any moment, really, of meeting this moment. We don't have to like the moment, but because you know we have things we like and more, and things we like less, and you know nothing wrong with that. But the truth, reality, is reality. You know what is is what is, and yet we um, yet we resist. We resist opening to the experience. And we often prefer, and I say we, I certainly include myself in this, I see myself doing it, um, that we add, you know, what often in Buddhism is called the second arrow, you know, the, the, the judgment or the resistance or the disliking of the experience that we add on top of the first arrow, which is just the reality of what was happened. Ouch, that hurts. You know, there's an inevitable ouch to being alive. You know, there's pleasures and pains, joys and sorrows. Um, but freedom comes from acknowledging and accepting that this, you know, this, what is, is, and not resisting. And so the absolute cooperation with the inevitable. Sometimes this understanding of saying yes to what is, is somewhat misconstrued by people. You know, it's kind of understood sometimes to mean like, oh, if you're in a, an abusive relationship, then you should just say, okay, yes, say yes to this being in an abusive relationship. We're not saying yes to, you know, what one ought to do about something. We're saying that we begin with the truth that this is, it is an abusive relationship or it is something, you know, this is the reality of, of what is. Then... There's the choice of how we meet this experience. You know, what, and then the question is, what is a, a proper, an appropriate response to what is, to the reality, the truth of what is? And if it's something that's inappropriate or abusive or something that should be changed, then wisdom says, or compassion says, yes, make that change. Um, so this cooperating with reality. I mean, I think you could think, see it as uh, Nelson Mandela, Mandela in, in, uh, on Robin Island. You know, I think the way that he was able to come to a place of compassion and forgiveness and a place of great open-heartedness 
was basically by saying, this is what is. You know, not resisting the truth of what is. It certainly resisted the appropriateness and the justification and the morality of it, absolutely. But the truth is, he didn't say, I shouldn't be here, therefore I'm, you know, I'm in this resistance to, um, to the reality of it. It was accepting, this is where I am and this is where I'm, I'm likely to be for some time. And from that place could develop the spaciousness, the forgiveness, the compassion, the wisdom that allowed him to play the incredible role that he played. So it's really, I mean, we're not talking about, you know, a kind of a passive, accept, you know, passive inaction, you know, I don't do anything, which is a kind of aversion, kind of collapsing inward. Um, so to be free is to be in alignment with the truth, with the way things are, not to not be in conflict with reality, with how life is unfolding here and now. The Buddha taught 2,500 years ago that when we're in conflict with reality, we inevitably suffer. We suffer when we want things to be other than the way they are. We're resisting the truth of what is. And, you know, as many of them, I'm sure many of us are familiar with the, you know, the basic teachings of the Buddha on suffering and the end of suffering. And the Buddha said, suffering comes from, from craving, to, from thinking that happiness can come from kind of holding on to or accumulating what we like and avoiding what we don't like or resisting what we don't like. Um, this is the first of the noble truths, is the acknowledgement of, of suffering, of you know, the, the pain of experience, and that the suffering comes from, um, from craving, from not seeing things as they really are, and trying to, and essentially being in conflict with reality. Whenever we cling to anything, we're in conflict with the way things are. Whenever we fundamentally push away experience, we're in conflict with the way things are. Whenever we judge ourselves, beat ourselves up, we're in conflict with the way things are. When we're resisting the truth of how things are. As the Buddha said, we're making essentially experiences which are essentially impermanent, we're treating them as though they were permanent. You know, we're treating experiences that are impersonal, selfless, as though they were really about me, that there was an I or a me or a mine behind it all. Um, and we're thinking we can find happiness where we can't possibly find lasting happiness. And that, the Buddha says, is a remedy for, for suffering. To be out of alignment with the way things are. With, to be out of alignment with reality. To, is, is delusion. And that's the basis of, of, uh, of, of craving and of suffering. And so the Buddha taught that freedom from suffering comes from turning towards the suffering and being willing to be with it. If we experience anything that's causing us suffering, we can turn towards it, open to it. You know, as the um, poem by uh, the Sufi poet Rumi says, welcome the guests. You know, the, the way of finding the way out, our way out of suffering is to welcome the truth of what is, to open to what's here. If it's painful, if there's harsh judgments that are coming up in the mind, to acknowledge that that's present. If there's resistance to what I'm experiencing right now, to open to that. To be with our experience as it is, is the Buddha taught, is the gateway to freedom from suffering. And when we do this, we can see, when we open to the truth of how life is, then we see into not just our own personal experience, but we see into the way life is. You know, we see through our subjective experience into the larger truth about life itself, that everything is impermanent, everything is changing that nothing can be held on to, nothing can be kind of permanently held on to. And that, um, and that the sense of a separate self just comes from the clinging itself, from not seeing things as the way they really are. 
So, so that's the, the third noble truth of the Buddha is that the way out of suffering is by opening to the truth of our experience. If I'm feeling you know, anger, hatred, resistance, to open to that. And if there's positive states of heart and mind, to open and be present to them. Um, the way out of clinging is to open the hand, you know, to let go. Um, this is the third noble truth, that freedom comes from seeing clearly and with that clear seeing that nothing can be held on to. Then we can let go and then there's freedom, freedom of the heart. And then the fourth of the, of the noble truths the Buddha taught is that there's a skillful path. There's a way to the end of suffering. And it's a training in ethics, virtue, living wisely and compassionately in the world is one. Cultivating wisdom, seeing things as they really are is the other, is a second. And third is training the mind through meditation, through mindfulness, through concentration, through wise effort, to train the mind to see things as they really are. As we do when we sit in meditation, as we did this evening, you know, it's possible to see perhaps more easily than we can in our daily lives. We can see stuff coming up. We can see where we get hooked on to things. You know, wanting things to be a certain way or not liking other experiences. And feeling restless or feeling bored or doubting why we came. came or, you know, and, and the, the practice of mindfulness is simply to notice that with a kind and non-judging awareness to see that. And this then, mindfulness then becomes a pathway to freedom, to freedom of the heart. That if we see things, as the Buddha taught in his fundamental teaching about, um, on mindfulness, that if we bring awareness to our experience, just as it is, then we see clearly the, um, the way all of life is. We see the three fundamental characteristics of life. We find mindfulness becomes a doorway, a gateway, whether we're bringing mindfulness to the body or to the emotions or other parts of our experience. Whatever gateway we come in, we come to see the truth of how all of life is, that nothing can be held on to, and that if we let go of clinging, there's freedom. So mindfulness becomes, is the doorway to freedom of freedom from suffering. I, I quoted the lines from uh, the poem by, by Dorothy Hunt, uh, Peace is this moment without judgment, this moment in the heart space where everything that is is welcome. So that in, in any moment of our lives, there's a possibility of being at peace. And all that's required is to just first notice what's getting in the way. You know, what am I holding on to? Is there something I'm believing about this moment that takes me away from just from cooperating with the inevitable, from cooperating with, with what is? What is it? Is there some resistance? There is, just to open to this. Can I open to this? Can I be with it? Can I be with this contraction? Can I be with the judgment? Can I be with the resistance? Open to it. Every moment. I mean, it's a, it's a, a beautiful thing, I think, to remember that every moment of our lives we have this possibility of, of, of freedom. Um, and... We have a practice that allows us to, to open to this moment and to let go and find freedom in, amidst whatever the, the circumstances and conditions of our life are. And yet, as we know, it's not easy, is it? We suffer when we resist life, when we believe this moment should be different or this experience should be different, when we want things to be the way we want them and we want the difficult or unpleasant things to go away. And freedom comes when we cooperate with the truth, with reality. Another way of saying this is taking refuge in the Dharma. 
taking refuge in the Dharma, which is the second of the Buddhist refuges, is to really find support, refuge in the truth, in the way things are. It's really that simple. Um, We may not like this moment or this situation, but if we can open to it, we can find the appropriate response we can, you know, as the serenity prayer says, we can change what we, what's possible to change, accept what we can't change, and, and hopefully have the wisdom to discern the difference between knowing what we can and what we can't change. So I think about this and I think, well, you know, yes, the um, freedom is cooperating with, with life. As a friend of ours, teacher, many of you know, Philip Moffat, he has a lovely title for his book on the Four Noble Truths, Dancing with Life. Dancing with Life. When we, when we cooperate with the way life is, we are, we're dancing with life. But, but so much of the time, I know for myself, um, so much of the time we're, we're not dancing with life. We're in a kind of wrestling match with it, I think. There's a kind of struggle with... This should be different, you know. And I find it fascinating how, um, you know, one can know this, you know, know that the freedom that comes from dancing with life, you know, with going with the flow of how life is. And that, doesn't, that includes changing what we can change. But meeting, meeting this moment, meeting our moments with open-heartedness, Dancing with what comes, the joys and the sorrows, the 10,000 joys, the 10,000 sorrows. Just kind of that, that, that movement, that relationship with life. And yet, how many of us live that freely? You know, so much of, you know, you know how many meditation teachers do you know who are kind of stressed out getting from one class to another. I certainly find it myself, you know. Of kind of like, oh, I've got to do this, got to do this. You know, and there's a kind of a, a, a tension you feel in your body. And what's wonderful is that you've, we have the practice to come back to. But, but so much of our lives, I think, and we're not really dancing with life. We're in, some, we're in a struggle with this moment, with the way things are. I just said, speak a little personally for a few minutes. If I look at my own life in recent years and think about when I've experienced suffering most intensely and most strongly, it's been at times when I was caught up in so, so strong anxiety, you know, and it came, um, came out of times where I thought I had too much to do, too many responsibilities and obligations, not enough time to do them all, not enough space to do them all. Anyone else experienced anything like that? (laughs) It's kind of like a pretty common thing in our society, in our culture. Um, And, you know, if I look at my own experience, it it kind of arose from uh, from a lack of awareness. There was some way in which I was kind of buying into a story about, you know, particularly about being busy, too much to do. And underneath that, as I looked at it, you know, um, underneath the anxious thoughts were fears that I wouldn't be able to do everything. You know, the whole thing of kind of juggling all these things. Something's going to go wrong. It's going to, you know, and that I would fail and that I'd let other people down and, you know, the, the kind of the house of cards would collapse, you know, that was kind of the underlying, the underlying fear, I think. And when I think about the times of difficulty, um, when, for example, as probably many of you have experienced it, waking in the night and kind of caught up, oh, I've got to, all these things I've got to do, and of course you can't get back to sleep because there's so, many, so much thinking, and then you worry about how tired you're going to be the next day, <laughs> and then that makes it even harder to get back to sleep. You know, and it's kind of, it all compounds itself like a big ball, you know? And um, I laugh about it now, but at the time it's, it's kind of very serious because it's like, oh, you know, my life's getting out of, out of control. And, um, and when, as I think about that, the, the suffering 
was never about what was happening in that moment. That was the kind of the, the, kind of the, the, the nugget, the lesson. The suffering was never about what was happening in that moment. You know, I would, you know, often it'd be, I'd be in a comfortable bed and my house would be warm. There was nothing kind of wrong with the situation. The only thing was wrong was the thinking. You know, the, the wrong, just not wrong in a, I shouldn't be, but it, it was out of kilter was the thinking. The thing that was causing suffering was the thinking. It, was, it wasn't about what was going on at that moment, although that moment was affected by all of this other stuff. But it was about the future. It was about an imagined future. Because the future is always imagined until it comes and then it's the present. You know, there's never really a future except, you know, up in the coconut. You know, so, um, you know, Eckhart Tolle in The Power of Now um, has a, it says a, a nice thing. He says, we can all, you can always cope with the present moment. You can never cope with the future can always cope with the present. It doesn't mean we always will be able to cope skillfully with the present moment, but we have the capacity. As Viktor Frankl talked about, even in the concentration camps, you know, he said they could take everything from us, but the last of the human freedoms, the freedom to determine how we meet our experience. So we, we have that capacity to cope with the present moment, but we can't cope with the future because the future is, is only a, a mind creation. And that as, yeah, as we know, that you know, the, the mind can create one scenario in one moment, and then a, a moment later it could be the complete opposite scenario. You know, it's, the mind is unreliable. As uh, Jack Cornfield would often say, the, the mind is a dangerous place. Don't go there alone. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, you know, it, the, the mind can get it, the everyday mind can get us, get us in trouble in that way. Um, and you know how, how the thoughts proliferate. It was very easy for one anxious thought to lead to another one and then to create a, you know, a very negative scenario. You know, that we, it can be catastrophic thinking because the mind can go anywhere. You know, I often joke that you know, if you just kind of, if there's not awareness of thoughts, then you'll, you know, the, you'll believe that you're going to end up naked, hungry, alone, in a ditch, you know, and, and, and add worse, because there could be worse things as well. People could be poking you with sticks or something, you know. The mind will create these scenarios and it will go from one thing to another to another. And, and why wouldn't it? What stops it if there's not awareness? It's awareness that stops it. But if there's not mindfulness, then the mind just goes wherever it goes. I mean, we only have to look around our world and see the suffering that comes from, um, from unawareness of, of thoughts, where people believe their thoughts and you know, create whole worlds around it and invade countries on the basis of some delusional thinking, you know, or harm people and kill people because of, we don't have to, I won't even go into the details, but we, we all know around us this kind of, the, the suffering that comes from, um, from lack of mindfulness of of, of, of thinking, of thoughts. Um, so, so freedom comes, for, in my own experience, um, freedom in this particular scenario of just the, the anxiety and kind of getting caught up in those kind of thinking, that kind of, um, kind of anxious, fearful thinking, um, very helpful to see that um, that the cause of it was was lack of mindfulness at some stage that there was not sufficient awareness of the thinking process and then the thoughts took on a kind of life of their own you know of like oh yeah but then what about this happens and what about if I'm not able to do this and that you know and and at a certain point it can take on a real strong energy of its own which is why mindfulness is so essential. And to, to be mindful as early in the process as we can. You know, if we can prevent it from arising. The Buddha said, you know, um, spoke about wise effort as involving um, kind of four basic practices. One is bringing mindfulness to what, you know, experience, what we're actually experiencing. 
but the second, or you know, kind of the other part of it, is to um, bring mindfulness to the causes that lead to the arising of unwholesome states or wholesome states. You know, to really see, you know, what is it that that can kind of create that that um, those scenarios to be to bring as as much awareness to, you know, what are the um, what are the conditions that lead to um, the, un- the arising of unwholesome states? Anxiety is an unwholesome state. You know, um, it's you know it's a hindrance in the mind. Um, but the way um, the way I was able to find some freedom in the midst of this was through this, these practices of cooperating with the inevitable, being willing to stay in this moment or that moment as it was, with what, what was going on. And at times it could be, you know, quite, quite intense. You know, how, you know, sometimes you wake in the night and the heart's beating really fast and, and it doesn't feel like it's, it's not fun to stay with that and kind of ride the waves of that. And then if there's lots of proliferation of thoughts, you know, just to notice the thoughts and let the thought come and go. And the Buddha said it very simply in one of his shortest and simplest teachings. He said, in the scene, just let there be the scene. In the heard, just the heard. In the understood, just the understood. In the known or thought, just the thought. To take each kind of frame of our experience and be with that. Because our suffering is almost always comes from a, you know, one thing leads to another. Difficult bodily sensations create an emotion that leads to you know, fearful thoughts which lead to more intense bodily sensations and emotions that create new scenarios. And we can kind of get caught up in this kind of ball of wax. And the Buddha's teachings are wonderful in terms of just this process of untangling. I think of it as untangling, like untangling a, you know, um, a ball of yarn where, you know, all different things of colors and, and, ball, and uh, things are, are rolled together just to kind of do that untangling. That, okay, this is mindful, being mindfulness to the body, to the breath, to the tightness in the chest, maybe the shortness of breath, breathe into it. Allow it all to come and go. Just see the impermanence of all of this. Let the breathing come and go. Let the sensations come and go. Feel the emotions. Let them come and go. Ride the waves. There's a lovely um, meditation practice that is um, based on um, coming out of mindfulness-based stress reduction that is used particularly with people working with substance abuse and in recovery, where where it's kind of one of riding the waves, riding the waves of our experience, riding the waves of, you know, the craving, the intense craving, to be able to stay with that and ride the waves. Because we know, um, you know, the intense feelings, the urges, the cravings, will only last a limited amount of time. The illusion in the mind is it's going to go on forever. This is this pain or this you know, intense clinging or wanting or craving is going to last forever unless I have the drink, I have the smoke, I have the drug, I have the cake, I have the whatever it is, unless I have the thing I want, you know. Um, That's the illusion, but if we can just stay with, just ride the waves of our experience, ride the wave, ride the the energy of, of the urges, of the impulses, of the craving, then we can find... Freedom, um, freedom in the midst of all of those experiences. Um, and it comes back down to just what am I aware of right now and can I be with this? Can I be with this, these difficult bodily sensations? Can I be with these difficult emotions? Can I bring awareness to the thoughts and let them come and go and see that they're impermanent, that they're not the truth, that they can, you know, if I don't identify with them, then they're just like bubbles that come and go, bubbles that seen and then they, you know, then they dissolve. It's only when we attach to them, when we cling, when we identify, then we get caught up in the suffering. But if we can just watch the arising, so riding the waves, I find that a very skillful um, practice, very useful practice. Um, so, so the the practices that we have for. Uh, for, um, for cooperating with the inevitable. I want to, just given time, I want to take a few minutes at the end here to, to finish off with um, talking a little bit about the science um, 
that's really uh, confirming what the Buddha taught 2,500 years ago and the practices of, of um, monastics and lay people over these 25 centuries. Um, the, the, the freedom that people experienced and gained in their own lives but didn't actually have fMRIs to measure you know, what was going on at the time. But knowing that there was freedom that came through, that comes through you know, bringing awareness to our experience and the practices of loving kindness and compassion and mindfulness and wise effort, concentration. Now we're at a place, a stage where it's an extraordinary time in the, uh, in the turning of the wheel of the Dharma. You know, we're right in the middle of it, right here and now in the West. Um, and um, in many ways, we, we have a tendency towards hubris, you know, of thinking, oh, what's happening here, there, therefore it must be really important. But I think if we had some magic ability to kind of step above, away from where we are, this moment we are at in history right now, maybe look at it from 100 years hence or 200 years hence, I think something really, really important is happening right now as the Dharma has come to the West and, has, and is meeting with you know, scientific understanding, um, is being put to the test, not the Dharma, the Dharma stands on its own feet, but, but the practices that um, are being kind of explored and seen, well, what actually is going on? What's going on in our brains? What's going on in our minds when we focus our awareness, when we pay attention in this way, when we concentrate the mind, when we bring loving kindness to our experience. We have, there's, there's amazing research going on and many of you I think know about it and it's all over the newspapers right now but it's an incredibly high quality research about what's actually happening in our brains when we meditate and why and how it leads to such extremely beneficial results in terms of um, you know, I, I just mentioned some of the things. Hundreds of studies show the benefits of mindfulness for conditions ranging from stress to anxiety to depression, anger, cancer, pain, substance abuse, psoriasis, fibromyalgia, you know, t almost, you know, it, 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 hundreds of studies. And, um, and what's really interesting is different things are going on. They're not, it, mindfulness isn't this kind of simple um, one, one size fits all thing. You know, and the Buddha, Buddha understood this very clearly 2,500 years ago. When he talked, when he defined mindfulness, he said, he kind of defined it as um, the mind being um, ardent, kind of effort, energy, diligence, um, clearly knowing, like a quality of understanding and seeing, and seeing things as they are, kind of an overall perspective, you know, kind of prefrontal cortex, I think we think of it, you know, as these days. Um, mindful, you know, just being present and attentive to our experience. So free from desires and discontents in relation to the world, which is another way of saying concentrated. So even those four different kind of modes, or not even modes of mindfulness, but qualities that make up mindfulness. And as the scientists, the neuroscientists, are looking at mindfulness today, they're looking, they're seeing, well, different things are going on, you know, different benefits for peop, you know, people with ADHD are benefiting from certain practices and certain aspects of mindfulness which aren't the same as for, say, people with depression. Or, or people undergoing stress. There's, mindfulness is, includes you know, a number of different dimensions. You know, it's not the same to say, well, we focus the mind and we concentrate and we become one-pointed. It's not the same as welcoming the guests and letting everything in and allowing the, different, the difficult emotions to come and opening to them and riding the waves of them. There's different things and different parts of the brain are, going, are, are operating in those. Um, you know, when we're, when, we're, when we're using, when we're practicing mindfulness in those ways. I just want to flag some of the, the studies that I've found most interesting and, and relevant and kind of enjoyable. There's one, um, I only just heard about this one recently. You might, have, might, might be aware of it. Um, and this is about how 
um, how bringing a quality of acceptance to our experience transforms the way we, we meet things and, and allows us much greater freedom than if we bring resistance to our experience or, or we fight our way through experiences. You know, in my first say, we say, kind of allow what's here to be as it is. What is that actually doing? Well, they did a study where they, um, they had two groups, kind of a, a, a one group um, that was given the instructions. There was a, a bucket of iced water. Put their hand, their arms in the bucket of iced water. Very cold, very painful. The first group was given the instructions of just kind of um, resist, you know, resist thinking about it and just stay with it. You know, kind of grit, grit, your, grin, you know, grit your teeth and, and stay with it. The second group was given the instructions to open as fully as you can to all of your experiences as they're coming up. So, you know, just the basic mindfulness instructions. Of like, you know, if, you, if it's feeling cold, just notice that, that you know, that, the, the sensations of that. Well, the, the, um, the upshot, the, the outcome was that those who were given the second instruction could hold their arms in the ice cold water, ice bucket um, twice as long, almost twice as long as those that were, you know, given the instruction just to stay with it. So essentially, so kind of like, okay, there's something about bringing an attitude of kindness, friendliness, welcoming our experience that allows us to not just endure but be with and open to even very, very painful and very, very difficult experiences. So that's kind of like, you know, anyone who's practiced knows this. But it's kind of nice to see it borne out with, you know, people sticking their arms in, in, in freezing, freezing cold water. Excuse me. Um, you know, that another study, one of the most important studies, I think in the last decade or so, um, involves what's called the um, default mode network of the brain. Um, what they've done, you know, through, you know, scanning brains of people, you know, imagine a group like this comes in. You're not meditators, just regular, regular civilians. Comes in, given instructions. They just say, sit quietly and, you know, just kind of rest your mind. Just, you know, no, no real instructions. Just maybe close your eyes and, 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 uh, and, and just be calm and rest. Well, what they found was that when, when, um, when we're in that resting state, the mind is overwhelmingly caught up in narratives, in thinking about the past and the future, in comparing ourselves to other people, in kind of really a lot of stories about who we are, who we are in relation to other people, what's going to happen in the future, what happened in the past, very little time is spent in the present moment. So this, they're saying, this, the neuroscientists are saying that this is basically a default mode of the mind without training, without conscious practice. They also found, though, that there's another mode of the, 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 the mind, where, which they call the experiencing mode. And this is basically where we are aware of our experience as it's happening. So it's essentially at what we're doing. You know, mindfulness of the body, mindfulness of the breath, mindfulness of thoughts, mindfulness of emotion, just noticing what's coming up. This is, this is an alternative mode. Um, the other thing that they found is that when we're in that narrative mode, the wandering mind, it tends to be associated with negative thinking. And when we're in the experiencing mode, it tends not to be associated with negative thinking. There was a nice um, um, kind of summary of artic uh, article of this study. And the headline, the, the title of it was, The Wandering Mind is an Unhappy Mind. The Wandering Mind is an Unhappy Mind. It, and this is what they're finding, that when, when we're in that, you know, in that default mode, then there's basically they're suffering. There's, there's, there's unpleasant negative experiences a lot of the time. And there, I won't go into the details more of the study just for time. But, um, um, and the, the opposite with the experiencing mode. But in order to kind of 
be in that experiencing mode, we have to train the mind. We have to actually practice. It has to be a conscious thing. And it seems, again, this kind of gets into, kind of some of it is somewhat speculative, of like, what's happening through evolution that, you know, that this default mode developed over hundreds of, probably hundreds of thousands of years since the prefrontal cortex was formed, maybe even millions of years. Um, you know, that this actually did serve an evolutionary function, but it doesn't serve us so well today, you know, to be in that mode a lot of the time. Mindfulness is what allows us to be in a different mode, a different way of being in the world. And so it's a kind of like this is a choice. We could just be in that kind of default mode, um, but we can choose by being present, by training the mind to... Um, to be in the present and to find peace in the present moment, to find freedom in the present moment. Kind of confirming really what the teachings, the Buddhist teachings have been saying for 25 centuries. And one final study just to mention, I've got a fourth one, but it's too complex to get into, but it's a really fun one. <laughs> Maybe I'll send it to you if you're interested. Um, the third one is, is simple but really important. As many of you are probably familiar with this one uh, from uh, 2011. How people who did an eight-week mindfulness course, they were, their brains were scanned before and after the course and compared with a control group. And they found that with just an average of 27 minutes of meditation a day, the areas of the brain associated with essentially positive qualities like um, learning and memory, um, self-awareness, compassion, and introspection. Those areas of the prefrontal cortex grew thicker. The gray matter got thicker in those areas. And the areas associated with stress and anxiety thinned. In just an average of less than 30 minutes a day training over this eight-week period. What it's saying really is that if just even a limited amount of meditation practice, we're actually changing our brains in really positive ways. Now, they've, they've done this with Tibetan monks who'd had 10,000 and 50,000 hours of practice, and everyone's, oh, yeah, what do you expect, you know, with that many hours? You'd think the brain would change. But eight weeks, 27 minutes a day average, the brains are changing. You, we were probably all familiar with neuroplasticity, that the brain changes through how we use our attention. And mindfulness is one of the most helpful ways of, of using our attention to cultivate wholesome, beneficial states, let go of, abandon the unskillful ones, as the Buddha had said many centuries ago. So the science is really coming to confirm the, um, the wisdom of being living in the present moment, being present, um, cooperating with the inevitable. So I'll finish with this tonight. I'm sorry, I've gone a couple of minutes over. Um, kind of a lot more to say and a lot more to discuss about this, and kind of lots of lots more information out there as well. Um, but I hope this um, I hope this has kind of given some maybe food for thought. I'd be happy to stay around if anyone has questions or um, uh, things you'd like to share. Um, and I hope that you can um, I hope that you can uh, cultivate, deepen this practice that is, you know, I've seen in my own life and I've seen in the lives of so many others as is such a, a gateway to, to freedom, freedom of the heart, freedom of the mind, living in a different way, living in a way in the world where, you know, we're much more able to bring kind of wiser ways of being in the, to, into the world and, and more compassion into the world. And I think through what's happening here and so many other places, change is happening even beyond the, um, you know, those who... Um, you know, or are, are consciously on a path of mindfulness or a path of dharma. You know, it's something, something really interesting and important is happening in our world. And I think, as some, you know, great teachers say, you know, that there seems to be a kind of a, a real turning because the need is so great, isn't it? If we look at our world today, the world needs 
this kind of wisdom much more than it needs the techno technological advances, which you know can be great. But but it's the the wisdom of, of really and the compassion of being at, being willing to be with our own experience and not to kind of foist it out onto the world in ways that cause harm. So thank you for your kind attention and um, it's been a pleasure to be with you this evening and I hope our paths cross um, again. Namaste.